Hello, welcome for the session on malaria. So we'll be talking about pharmacotherapy of malaria and the following headings. First, we'll try to understand what is malaria. What is the causative organism? How does it invade our body? Where does it stay and what does it do? Which would then lead to the manifestation of signs and symptoms. And if we understand all this about malaria, then we will understand how we can plan strategies for treatment or even prevention of these infections. Once we know the broad strategies to be employed, we will go on to study the actual drug regimens. Out of the drugs available, what are the drugs and how are they being used to treat or prevent malaria? By now we have many drugs for treatment of malaria and they were developed as a need because the primary drug which was used to treat all types of malaria infections for many years, chloroquine. There are plasmodia which have become resistant to chloroquine now. So there are separate treatment strategies, regimens for chloroquine sensitive malaria and for chloroquine resistant malaria. Similarly, we need to employ special measures to treat malaria in situations like pregnancy. Lastly, we are going to see the details of the individual drugs which are being used in these regimens so that we understand why they are used, how important they are, and also we understand what could be the limitations and where they need to be avoided. <coughs> so we're going to study all this content in different parts. Part one will be devoted to understanding malaria and the broad treatment strategies. In part two, we will study the treatment regimens for chloroquine sensitive malaria. Part three will deal with treatment regimens for chloroquine resistant malaria as well as the management of malaria in pregnancy. And part four will deal with the details of individual drugs. So let us start with part one. What is malaria? Malaria is a vector-borne protozoal infection. Though there are various species across the globe, the common ones in India are Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium falciparum. <clears throat> Amongst these two, Plasmodium falciparum can manifest as very serious infections where patients could worsen into even coma or unconsciousness and even fatal outcomes have been obtained. When the we call this as cerebral malaria, where there is loss of consciousness, where there, is, there are convulsions. And unfortunately, the serious type of malaria caused by Plasmodium falciparum is posing a problem because Plasmodium falciparum has developed resistance to the primary drug that is chloroquine. Plasmodium vivax, on the other hand, and even ovale, the manifestations are much milder and fortunately that is the common variety in India. But they have the peculiarity of relapsing. So even after we treat the patient for this malarial attack, after a few days, he again may start manifesting the symptoms, though he's not got fresh infection. That is what is called as relapse. So malaria manifests as fevers with chills. So in colloquial terms, it's often called as hivatap, which means the patient shivers as if he's getting feeling very cold. So there are rigors and chills accompanied with fever. And this occurs with a relatively defined periodicity. We'll talk about it later. When it was known that it's a vector-borne infection and the vector which gives us this infection is female Anopheles mosquito, obviously India put a very strong vector control program and aggressive vector control program in place which almost made malaria disappear in around 1960. However, as we've been talking about resistance to drugs by falciparum, even the mosquitoes developed resistance to our insecticides. So malaria has staged a comeback. And today, it is endemic in areas inhabited by 80% of Indians. That means 80% of us stay in areas where malaria is quite common, endemic. And as we already discussed, it is becoming a problematic situation because of development of resistance to primary drugs. So let's see now what this malaria does in the body and therefore understand what are the treatment strategies which have been devised to tackle this malaria infection. 
as we discussed the plasmodium sporozoites are injected by mosquitoes into our blood stream the first place they go to is the liver where they replicate and this is called as pre erythrocytic schizogony and the forms of malaria which are there plasmodia in this these tissues are called pre erythrocytic schizons or tissue schizons why because subsequently they are released into the blood stream as merozoites and these merozoites invade the red blood cells or erythrocytes so the merozoites which have invaded the erythrocytes and start replicating there they are called erythrocytic schizons and therefore the previous stage is called as pre erythrocytic schizon or tissue schizons as i said these erythrocytic schizons replicate inside the rbcs and after some replications they rupture the rbcs to come out to release fresh merozoites into the blood stream and every time the rbcs are ruptured and merozoites are released the patient manifests with that typical rigors with fever chills and fever so clinical attack of malaria clinical manifestation of malaria coincides with rupture of rbcs to release the merozoites some of these merozoites reinvade new rbcs and replicate there and again get released and therefore the periodicity of fever every time they rupture the rbcs and get released there is fever and accordingly the malarial parasites the infection is also classified as tertian malaria if the fever occurs every third day as in case of vivax and novel or quartan malaria if the fever occurs every fourth day because the rupture occurs every fourth day as in case of falciparum malariae which is not very common in india plasmodium falciparum is often called as malignant tertian because though the periodicity is essentially tertian it can progress to very serious manifestations where the patient is continuously getting high fever and as we discussed it can give us even fatal outcome so plasmodium is referred to as malignant tertian malaria now some of these merozoites may reinvade the rbcs but some get converted into gametes gametocytes and these gametes can be picked up by another mosquito biting this person who is having malaria and transmit the sporozoites to another individual so existence of gametes in circulation is responsible for transmission from an infected patient to other human beings through the mediation of the vector mosquito so if you understand this life cycle and its manifestations in the human body we can devise a treatment strategies so if patient comes to you with fevers and chills you suspect malaria the first thing is to get the blood smear assessed for the presence of plasmodia and once confirmed we can start him on a treatment for clinical cure that is to control these clinical manifestations and how do we control them we need to stop the rupture of rbcs for releasing the merozoites so we need to kill the erythrocytic schizons within the rbcs so the drugs used are erythrocytic schizonticides so the forms in the red blood cells are called erythrocytic schizons where the drugs which are used to kill these erythrocytic schizons are called erythrocytic schizonticides if you want to block the transmission we need to kill the gametes so that a mosquito cannot pick them up and then donate them or give them to another human being so to block the transmission we need a gametocidal agent a drug which can kill the gametes such a separate gametocidal agent would be required only for falciparum because erythrocytic schizonticides used to cure or control the clinical attack in vivax and ovel are also capable of killing the gametes so for vivax and ovel we do not need a separate gametocidal agent but many of these erythrocytic schizonticides cannot kill the falciparum gametes so there you would need another gametocidal agent though vivax doesn't need a gametocidal drug separately 
it has another feature which may require another drug. So when the sporozoites invade the liver and develop as pre-erythrocytic schizons, some of these schizons remain sleeping, remain dormant in the liver. They do not all enter the bloodstream at a time as merozoites. And when the patient manifests with the clinical attack, we may treat him, we may eliminate the erythrocytic schizons, but these hypnozoids remain safe because erythrocytic schizonticides, most of them, do not have any effect on tissue schizons or pre-erythrocytic schizons. And therefore, when these hypnozoids decide to come into circulation, there is a relapse. That means without getting a fresh infection, the patient again starts manifesting with the clinical attack of malaria. So if we do not want this relapse, we need to completely eradicate the malarial parasite from the body. Not only erythrocytic schizons, but also tissue schizons. And this is referred to as a radical cure of malaria. And as we've seen already, hypnozoids is a feature of vivax and ovale, not of falciparum. So falciparum is not a relapsing malaria. Only vivax or ovale tend to make the patient go into relapse and therefore they would need a drug which is a tissue schizon decide if you want to avoid relapse. Another clinical strategy required is, we discussed that 80% of us are staying in endemic areas. What if a person who is staying in non-endemic areas where malaria is not common and you are practicing there, he needs to go to some endemic area. He is very likely to approach you and ask for treatment to prevent getting malaria. And this strategy is referred to as prophylaxis for travelers going into endemic areas. And two strategies were possible for this. Kill the schizons in the pre-erythrocytic stage itself so that they do not enter the bloodstream. So there's no question of invading the RBCs and rupturing them and coming out. And this type of prophylaxis is called as causal prophylaxis. So again, for causal prophylaxis, we need a tissue schizonticide. And the tissue schizonticide which we have, which is used for radical cure for vivax and which could have been used for this causal prophylaxis is primaquin. But for causal prophylaxis, primaquin would have to be taken throughout the stay in the endemic area. Started before going there, taken throughout the duration of stay and continued a few weeks later. And primaquin is not a safe drug. It can lead to hemolytic reactions. And therefore, it is not safe for chronic use. So we do not use causal prophylaxis. Then how do we prevent malaria in this traveler? We keep on giving him erythrocytic schizonticides. They started before he goes to the endemic area, continued throughout the stay and a few weeks later. So that even if he gets the infection from the mosquito, even if it reaches the erythrocytes, the clinical attack will not occur because the erythrocytic schizons will be killed inside the RBCs. They are not allowed to be released into the bloodstream. So suppressive prophylaxis is what we do use for protecting a traveler going from non-endemic areas to endemic areas for maybe even a few months of prevention has been given earlier even for a few years. So these are treatment strategies that we have discussed and these are the groups of agents. So erythrocytic schizonticides are drugs which would kill the schizons inside the erythrocytes. Gametocide is a drug which will kill the gametes. And though there are overlapping actions, so some erythrocytic schizonticides do kill the gametes of vivax and ovale, for example. And the drugs which kill the tissue schizons are called tissue schizonticide. You need to remember these terminologies to answer the quiz, which comes later, comes right now with you, to help you recapitulate what we've discussed in this part one. What have you understood about malaria and what are the treatment strategies employed? So please try to remember and note down what is the phase of malarial parasite in the body which corresponds with the clinical attack of rigors and fever and which is the class of drugs, drugs having which action would be required to control this clinical attack.
to block transmission, which species needs to be given another drug for uh, what is the target form of the malarial parasite, very obvious, and which species of malaria requires a separate drug for this transmission. What is radical cure? In which species of malaria is it required? And which is the drug which is used for radical cure? And how do we give preventive treatment? What are the two possibilities which were considered? Which of them is not used and which of them is used to protect a traveler going into endemic areas for a certain period of time? So these are the key points to understand and remember from this part of malarial uh, session on malaria. So happy learning. Thank you. We'll meet again with the second part.